Um, our next speaker is Professor Offenberg, a senior lecturer at the Department of Arts at Bengaluru University of Nigeria. She actually doesn't need uh, introduction here. We all know her. Um, her book, Illuminated Piety, Plastic Text in the North French Miscellanea. We know her many articles. We know that she's editor or co-editor of um, the journal of the JICA. Um, and she's going to speak about Hasidic ideals as expressed in medieval Jewish art. אני רוצה קודם כל כמובן להודות למארגנים, כמו כולם, אבל באמת מגיע למארגנים, לאלישבע, לאפי, לאליזה, ממילא לא במה מהלושן שלי, אז אני רוצה להודות לעוד מישהו, כי אני באמת התגלגלתי לחקר חסידה אשכנז במקרה, ממש במקרה, לפני קצת יותר מעשור, הייתי בסוף הדוקטורט, נרשמתי לקורס סמינר אצל פרופסור רמי ריינר על ספר חסידים. אז בזכותו אני כאן, כן אמרתי לו את זה בפניו, אז אני יכולה לחזור על זה שוב, ובבוקר נאמר שאסור ללמד תורה, בעיקר סוד, לנשים. דניאל אברהם, קצת הסתבכת. כי ענבל ואני למדנו אצלו, ישבנו אצלו, אני הייתי כמעט חופשית, בקורס על המיסטיקה של חסידי אשכנז. זה הרקע שלי. עכשיו אני עוברת לאנגלית. אזיקיאל's vision of the chariot and the image of Jacob engraved upon the throne received much attention in the writings of חסידי אשכנז. I wish to discuss few aspects of this of this writing, especially in Sefer Gematriot, and the way they are portrayed in two manuscripts from the 13th century, where I refer first to the text, only afterwards to the images. First, I shall begin with the London Miscellany, produced in northern France around 1280. And I imagine you know it from the writings of Professor Kanan Fogel and Elisha uh, Rabangarten and Chukotelinski. Uh, and it contains various texts, about 80 uh, writings, different writings, um, some of them written on the margin. One such text is a collection of numerological associations in my field <coughs> that contains commentary, commentary on all paragraphs of Exodus, except for the last two, and the beginning of uh, Genesis. It's, as I said, um, here it's on the margins. The main text is the uh, Smak, it's the oldest copy of the book. Approximately half of the text is identical to the text of Sefer Gimatriot of Rabbi Judah Pius, found in Ashkenazi manuscript of the late 13th or early 14th century, now in Jerusalem, printed in two editions. The first of these is the facsimile edition published in 1998 and introduced by Daniel Abrams and Israel Tashman. The second is an annotated edition published by Israel, uh, Israel uh, Yaakov Israel Star in 2004. The Gematria text in the London Miscellany is well edited and follows the biblical order, as opposed to the more associative structure of the Gematria in the Jerusalem Ashkenazic manuscript. The importance of the text uh, here is that it uh, it's being an early manuscript, probably copied even before the Jerusalem manuscript of Sefer Gematriot was written copied. Moreover, not only it is an early copy, but it was copied in northern France and not in Germany, and we heard about it yesterday also. There are important differences between the text in the London Miscellany and, and that of the Sefer Gematriot in particular, and other, uh, other writings of Hasid Ashkenaz in general such as the omission of the direct man, uh, mention of two subjects, the issue of the divine glory, the Kabod, and the secret of the Nath, so it goes, that is the correlation between the Merkava and the shape of the Nath. Although the text in the London Miscellany deals with the vision of the Merkava, the issue of the Kabod and the question of whose image is upon the throne is not articulated. Perhaps the most mystical ideas <coughs> related in the London Miscellany are found on folios 
Provides commentary and the Matriot on Exodus 23 to 24. This marginal text addresses two issues mentioned in the writings of Hasid Ashkenaz that are also connected to the Halot literature. The first of these is the, his Metatron, and the second is Jacob's image engraved upon the throne. In what follows, I will demonstrate that not only does the text relate to some sections in the Sephardi Matriot, and the writings of Rabbi Elazar Forbes, but also it serves as a link connected to the Yehovah literature. At the beginning of the section, we learn that Metatron is called by the name of his master, and thus refers to it, and referred to as Adonai Katan. The explanation is that, that he is called by this name in Sefer Higalim. If you don't know this book, you're not alone. <laughs> the only use of the word Higale, known to me, at least during the Middle Ages, is in the Echalot in the literature. And I thank uh, Israel Spal for uh, drawing my attention to the use of this phrase, Sefer Echalot, in two more uh, texts of Hasid Ashkenaz, Aubata Bosem, which we heard about it yesterday, and Rokeach. These are the only two I uh, know. Let us first look at the section of the Gematriot. And I'll, I'll read the Hebrew, it will go much faster. Translation. Um, and here, that's the next place. Bessever Higale, Vezeshmo Keshamrabo. This text is quite similar to the text uh, that appears in some section of the Sephardi Matriot, now in Jerusalem, um, where it is mentioned that Metatron is called the Danai Katan in Sefer Echalot. Metatron is called the literature of the Echalot was familiar to Hasid Ashkenaz, who indeed elaborated upon it. The portion of the Echalot Rabati is referred to in the writings of Rabbi Elazar of Worms as Sefer Echalot, as it appears in the Sefer Gematriot. That's Echalot and uh, Sefer. Uh, um, in three of the manuscripts of the Chalot literature, which contain the part of the Chalot Rabati, um, we find the word Higale, used in two ways. It is used to mark the ending of a certain su subject, so, such as Sole Higale, or as mainly used at the beginning of the section. It is possible that the manuscript of the Chalot literature, or more specifically Chalot Rabati, was familiar to the compiler of our numerological association text. And perhaps because of the use of the word Higale, maybe at the beginning, it was known by the name Sefer Higale. For now, it is difficult to determine whether there might have been an, a tradition of calling in Halot Rabati by this name, or whether this may be a singular case. Not only is the text in the London Miscellany well rooted in the Hasid Ashkenaz writings, but we, find, but we find here a possible link between our manuscript and the Echalot literature. On two uh, manuscripts of the Echalot, the word Higale is used in the context of Jacob's image engraved upon the throne, as in the section provided, um, previously cited from our London Museum. The tradition of Jacob's image engraved upon the throne was studied at length by Elliot Wolfson, who explored both mystical and sexual aspects of this motive in rabbinic literature and in the writings of Hasid Ashkenaz. This notion is rooted in the Aramaic version of Genesis 28-12, regarding Jacob's dream where the angels climb up the ladder to view his image engraved upon the throne. Wolfson described in details how this motive evolved and was utilized in the commentaries on Ezekiel's chariot. 
the phrase and under his feet. מתחת רגליו מלמד שדמות יעקב הכיסא ודמות פניהם ופני אדם סופם תם is part of a long tradition of associating the image of Jacob, also known as Tom, innocent, with a human figure from Ezekiel's vision. The mention of Jacob's image engraved upon the throne appears once again on folio 626a, where another important element is added. וראית את אחוריי בגימטריה ובדמות יעקב של חפוקה בכיסא. Wolfson noticed that the combination of the phrase from Exodus 33, you shall see my back, you will see uh, my back, and Jacob's image in, uh, upon the throne together, and in these exact words, mainly, is apparent mainly in the writings of Rabbi Lazar Worms. According to Wolfson, this numerological equivalence originated in uh, Rabbi Lazar's uh, commentary on the Merkava. Thus, it seems that this motive was introduced in, uh, to the compiler of the Gematriot text in the London Miscellany through the writings of Rabbi Lazar. This notion of Jacob's image engraved upon the throne appears in the Piyut and Piyut commentaries, such as the Chayot Mo Ba'ot HaKiseh in our manuscript as well, and an illustration of the four creatures, the Chayot, is portrayed around the Piyut the Chayot Ba'ot, okay, and from here, from now on, it's artistic stuff, okay? So <laughs> you can breathe, okay, not only the guys, so I'm here, yeah, I'm an art historian, I know. Um, so that, um, the creatures are illustrated within a golden frame around the period. Um, at the top right, an eagle, here, that's, that's an eagle, a uh, human figure looks like an angel, you can see his face, an ox and a lion back to back. Okay. And two more creatures here, some sort of a lizard or a dragon but without wings. Uh, it is interesting to note that this illustration, like other illuminations in Hebrew manuscripts, Use a, use, uses a Christian model to portray animal, the animals. Um, there, in, there is an exception in the London Miscellany where instead of the angel's face being painted, silver paint covers it. Uh, it's, it looks like it's black, but uh, it's, uh, it's dark. So, um, there is no illumination of Jacob in the entire manuscript, and there are lots of people of illuminations throughout this manuscript. And since the Gimakriya text, Piyutin and their commentaries mentioned that Jacob's image was engraved upon the throne, in a way, this illustration of the angel is the only image of Jacob, so to say, uh, to be illustrated in this manuscript. The creatures are displayed according to the order in which the four creatures are displayed in Christian art and are understood as symbols of the evangelist and associated with the second coming of Christ. For example, here is the left, and in the tympana from uh, Shal. Uh, it should be noted that in most of these Christian scenes, Jesus appears in the Natshe-shaped mandorla, also known as the Maiesus Domini. And although the, the London Miscellany follows the Christian iconography of the scene, there is no portrayal similar to the mandorla or the nut. Thus we notice that the visual image of the nut, which resembles the Christian mandorla, is absent in this manuscript. <coughs> we can understand this omission of the mandorla and nut shape is not only due to the avoidance of Christological ideas, but also to the secret of the nut that is omitted from this manuscript. And if we follow other manuscripts, uh, Hebrew uh, manuscripts, let us turn to the, this one um, mentioned by Catherine Kodron Akko, who studied uh, the lights of Mahzor and we heard about it when we first um, she, uh, According to Catherine Kodron Akko, uh, she studied the image of Jacob being great upon the throne represented by the human figure as one of the four creatures illustrated here in the lights of Mahzor. The four creatures are illuminated in, a, um, in separate medallions around the initial word L of the Piyut al Mitnaseh for the tractate Shkalim. <coughs> that's, that's the human. 
um, he is different uh, in, of any portrayal in Jewish or Christian art. Uh, as he not only lacks wings, but is hooded man holding a book. According to Hajman Apple, the image reflects ideas based on the mystical writings of Hasidah Ashkenaz, especially those of Rabbi Lazar of Worms, regarding both the penitential program in which the sins, virtues, and even virtues should be balanced by different acts of penance, and the vision of the human figure of Jacob engraved upon the throne. Thus, as noted, the throne and the four creatures appear in other Hebrew manuscripts. If I would skip one, skip this one. And um, the order of the creatures uh, in the London Miscellany is different also from the order in the double Marso, uh, probably per, uh, produced in Essendon around 1290, where the creatures are displayed as a mirror image of those in uh, the London Miscellany. And uh, this is a potential coming for young people. And um, as already uh, mentioned by Ochel Vishnitzer, the frame is illuminated like an open gate, as it is appropriate, appropriate for this text, and contains four medallions with uh, themes from Ezekiel's uh, image. The four creatures, and you see them here, that's angel-like person, man, the eagle, and the ox and the, um, the lion. Here rests the throne. And I lost my place here. So, <laughs> well, it's here. Okay, an empty old golden chair on a blue background situated on top of the arch. Oh. I'm not as dramatic as in the bubble. Gabriel Sadrina claims that the empty chair is the throne of God. She mentions that the iconography is unique. According to Seth Ryan, uh, this is an image of the Merkava that follows the ideas of Hasid Ashkenaz that were circulated in Ashkenaz during the 12th and 13th century as, as it's uh, She doesn't mention any specific text or uh, discusses the way in which these mystical ideas were absorbed in this manuscript, but only mentions that it is related. It is not my purpose here to further discuss this, this issue, just to illustrate that there is another illumination that possibly was influenced by Hasid Ashkenaz. The last thing uh, I wish to discuss is a micrography on the margins of a Bible, um, Ashkenazi Bible. This Ashkenazic manuscript, produced in the second half of the 13th century, displays the creatures twice in the same page. Uh, the page uh, contains three columns of text, one on the right, um, and the last verse is from the Isaiah were written, while the two other columns contains the beginning of Ezekiel. The Masora of my prophecy portrays the four creatures from Ezekiel's uh, vision and are portrayed here on the upper side and on the lower side, not in, in the same uh, direction. And I wish to draw your attention to the fact that here the lion and the ox are facing each other to uh, portray the peace on earth and in heaven, and um, as you know also um, Michael Schneider is working on this issue of um, the creatures when they are facing each other. <coughs> um, the human figure here is dressed in full armor and appears like a knight. Um, in the context of the combination of Isaiah and Ezekiel, with the image of the creatures portrayed, the whole page setting represents the throne of God. As I suggested elsewhere, uh, the choice to portray the human figure in full armor and as a knight can be explained by the tradition of Jacob's image engraved upon the throne based on Ezekiel's vision that identifies the human figure with Jacob. The knight in this micrography may illustrate the verse Abir Yaakov, meaning Jacob, Jacob's guardian, Guardian Knight or Jacob the Knight. Although the idea of Jacob's image engraved upon the throne has been well known since the beginning period, the association between the, the Dutch tokens of the phrase Abilia Pope <coughs> first appears in the 13th century when Rabbi Lazar of Worms con connected Abilia Pope with the image of Jacob upon the throne. So it 
was not separately, but to combine the image of Jacob and the night, that that's something new for um, this period. Um, as this mythography decoration appears in the Bible, and there are no other texts within it, it is hard to pin down only the Bible to pin down the particular verses that the designer had in mind when planning this image. However, in considering the intellectual atmosphere at the time and place this manuscript was produced, we can conclude that this portrayal visualizes some of the ideas of Hasid Ashkenaz. Instead of understanding the biblical verses as referring to the Lord as the night, here we find the night identified as Jacob. This understanding um, of the text is apparent in Rabbi uh, Chaim Paltiel's commentary on the Torah. And uh, he mentions on De Genesis 49, Bir Yaakov, um, that's the English translation, as opposed to the Lord who is the night. Here, Jacob is the hero. Um, in his left hand, the knight holds a rectangular object. In the scene in the Leipzig Mahzor, Jacob is holding a book, which characterizes him as a scholar. We may assume that something similar, to, uh, similar is portrayed in this micrography decoration, as the horizontal lines of the object in his hands look more like some sort of a document, or a writing tablet, or a form book, even though it's a bit blurry. Uh, its abstract form uh, makes it uh, more difficult to identify it as the shape of a scroll or a book. An image of Jacob holding a document or a book according, uh, accords with his identification as Tom, innocent scholar, seated in a tent and studying. In Sefer Gimatriot, going back there, copied in, an Ashkenazim, in the Ashkenazi manuscript, we find an, the explanation for Jacob's image being engraved upon the throne that is related to his, Jacob's study of the Torah, which is resting beneath the throne. Thus, Sephardim Matriot makes the connection between the image of Jacob on the throne and the study of the Torah. And the micrography seems to combine the idea of the creature with a human face as, representing, as represented by Jacob and his appearance, not only as a heroic knight, but also as a scholar. Jacob studying the Torah seems to be most fitting in the context of a mic properly decorating, um, decorated in um, Bible manuscript. That's fair. According to Ivan Marcus, that's important. Um, and I'm quoting. Uh, the Jewish writers portray Jews as knights of, of the God of Israel, in contrast to the Christian knights and rebels who travel towards a worthless goal. In his discussion of passages from Sefer Hasidim, Marcus contends that the Jewish writer sees the, posi the positive value of monthly code and honor and valorous behavior, but implies that the Jewish pieties should behave in this manner, manner and serve, and serve the Lord fearlessly without expecting any reward. Therefore, knights in Jewish writings suggest the more spiritual aspect and re, um, spiritual aspect of noble warriors. Um, thus, <clears throat> uh, those qualities that reveal their heroic nature. As there is neither a sword or any other deadly weapon, there is a weapon, but not a deadly one, in, his, in this micrography, the image portrays the human figure of Jacob in a heroic manner, but not, but not as a man of war. Rather, as in Rabbi Chaim Paltiel's interpretation of Rabbi Yaakov, as mentioning Jacob who is the hero of the champion, the entire visual design of the page is intended to reflect Ezekiel's vision and thus offers the reader, the viewer of this Bible, a frame a frame for the text, which reflects some of the most mystical notions of the time in the image of the four creatures and Jacob's image as the true scholarly knight engraved upon the throne. 